So today is Wednesday, September 11th, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 190 at block height 594,365. So what is cracking today, guys? Oh, just, yeah, a lot of different stuff, you know. There's lots of news to talk about, but there's, uh, you know, things going on with prices always, but... There's also this, uh, yeah, conference going on, the scaling Bitcoin. So yeah, there's a lot to talk about. So what's up, guys? Janine, no para. Uh, well, I'm currently reading Bitcoin Billionaires, which I think only came out like two months ago or something. And actually, I only ever watched the Social Network movie about Facebook last month, even though it was released way back in 2010, because I don't need more reasons to hate Facebook. But most of this book basically takes place after that movie, when the Winklevi are known more broadly outside of Harvard and Lake Carnegie. Um, but the first couple chapters are just kind of funny, because it's basically them complaining about their inability to give away their money to due to Mr. Sugar Mountain. Uh, constricting their reputation and then I'm currently at the part where they're meeting Charlie Shrem and Eric Voorhees in 2012 and yeah basically it's just going to various rich kid parties trying to impress each other uh, and complaining about the fact that Silicon Valley had unfriended them <laughs> so pretty funny I'm a Bitcoin a billionaire like, I don't care. <laughs> well, that's what the normies are reading right now. So what I wanted to say is that you have to talk a lot more about that book. I mean, if you take the time to read it, please, please say something about it. Uh, I mean, I briefly skimmed it, and I'm, I'm only a couple of chapters in, but at the end, uh, I was pretty got pretty pissed off because I believe there's a line saying that Ross Elbricht will die in prison, which is not fun to read, so. All right. So let's get into the stories then. All righty. Uh, so this one is a doozy, and uh, forgive myself if I trip up a bit in trying to break this down for everybody. I just went through this this morning. But there is an interesting development uh, going on regarding the Financial Asking, or Action Task Force uh, travel rule proposal for virtual asset service providers so like the, the the trying to drop all of the legacy banking rules onto the crypto space um the blockchain analytics company cypher trace has actually developed a a proposal with a white paper for a top layer peer-to-peer -peer protocol uh to allow all of these businesses to comply with these regulations and it is like honestly like the, the the flip side the the positive side of this i think is it demonstrates an acceptance to some degree of their inability to control a system like bitcoin but on the other side is showing they're starting to get inventive and understand the ways in which they can and can't try to force these types of, of regulations or standards into the system in some way, even if they can't force it into the, the base foundational layer. 
And so what they're doing is is proposing, you know, literally a peer to peer um, protocol and network for all of these companies to handle passing the identifying information around regarding any transactions between these businesses using cryptocurrency to the transaction without actually embedding it on the network or protocol level of the cryptocurrency itself. And so what they want to do is effectively build out a centralized certificate authority that would certify and issue uh, cryptographic certificates to uh, legal registered cryptocurrency businesses in the same way that certificate authorities issue certificates for websites out there. So it's literally building the, a parallel version of the same kind of encryption infrastructure that allows secure connections over the internet and, and connections that allow you to verify you're actually connecting to the appropriate person. And then from there, after establishing a centralized authority, effectively that would come with all of the information necessary about a business, the, the organizational name, the registration number, place of business, the jurisdiction it's in, and a domain name that can be reached publicly to initiate connections with that vast. And then effectively, Every transaction interacting with one of these VASPs would have to follow this protocol where they receive the request to make a transaction from the user of their business. They, before making that transaction on this other protocol network, communicate to the other business money is being sent to if it's another business. Um, send over the information regarding the customer that's sending the money, get a receipt back from the, the business that is receiving this transaction, acknowledging and cryptographically signing that they've received the customer information uh, about the sender. And then only after this process has gone through, submit an actual transaction on the blockchain network. Now this introduces a couple problems here um you know first off all of the exchanges in this ecosystem are finally starting to get to the point where they are batching transactions being efficient with their use of block space and this kind of requirement um, for every transaction they make would completely negate all, all of these benefits now everything that they push out onto a cryptocurrency network has to have this entirely separate process on a separate network fulfilled for every transaction before it can actually be submitted. So the entire batching process will become very inefficient and unoptimized. Now, also, there's another issue of um, how do you tell whether a transaction is being made to another business in which case you are legally required to use this protocol to exchange all the identifying information or whether it's being made to a private wallet in which case you don't have to do these things and that issue appears regardless of whether the business um, involved is sending a transaction or receiving one and that is a huge margin of error because if they screw that up and accept a transaction thinking it's from a private wallet or going to a private wallet and later find out that it was a registered business, they're now in legal violation of all, all these rules. And so now there's going to be an even greater layer of complexity where there needs to be some layer in the system to allow these businesses to look at an address alone and without the customer telling them whether it's another business or a private wallet, being able to search through an index of all known addresses associated with businesses to prevent a transaction from occurring with another licensed business that does not follow the travel rules. And so like, I hope you can see like very quickly just how this is layering huge central points of failure onto this. Like this, it becomes something that you have to deal with whenever you interact with one of these businesses or 
if any of these these central things go down, if, if a, the certificate authority for this protocol goes down, if the index authority that maps addresses to known businesses goes down, then none of these businesses can process any transactions or any activity whatsoever until those systems come back up because they will not be able to know if they're in violation of, of the law or not without these kinds of systems. And as well, having to comply with this type of system, right now, all of the private information businesses like that have is in a silo. They're the only ones with it. It's not being freely traded around. If they're a responsible company, they can even take the extreme measure of getting that information, verifying it, and then storing it encrypted offline so that you can't have your private information compromised. But if this type of system is pushed and required, then all of these businesses cannot do that. You no longer can take those extreme security measures with your customer's information because that information has to be online constantly, has to be accessible to interact with this other protocol. And it's just, it's outright crazy. And it's pretty much trying to, like, this would take a very robust distributed market that is almost impossible to bring to a halt and create a single point of failure that could bring the entire market to a halt. And this is the kind of, of shit being being proposed right now by the, the stupider, uh, less ethically aligned companies in this space to deal with the proposed F or FATF travel rules being applied to cryptocurrencies. So like this is pretty fucking crazy. This seems unreal to me, uh, but if it would be real, then it will definitely be a huge eye opener for anyone who is on the on the edge of deciding: well, should we have privacy or shouldn't we have privacy? Uh, this will be an eye opener if this happens, but I don't think so because, well, as you described it, it's 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 not something that you can put in practice. Well, no, yeah, this is. Sorry, real quick, Rick, I want to respond to that. But it's like, you can do this in practice. That's the thing, Nopar. It's just expensive and very resource intensive. So this would effectively be regulatory capture. Like it would raise the cost of being a cryptocurrency business because you have to comply with this system if this were implemented and required. So it's absolutely possible, but it would have a very damaging, centralizing effect on the ecosystem. And even if we had the confidential transactions on the chain, like it wouldn't matter for a system like this because it's all on the second layer. It will completely cut in half, like coins that are going in and out of custodial businesses like this and coins that aren't. And even with confidential transactions on everything, all of those coins touching these businesses are identifiable and trackable because you are going to have to connect these or your personal information to these transactions on a second layer, whether they have something like CT or not. Well, this is where I think whenever this whole rule came about, whenever the FATF started proposing this at the beginning of this year about implementing the travel rule in the industry, I think everybody that was a serious exchange said it was absolute joke because it destroys some, some of the major value propositions for Bitcoin and uh, being able to move uh, funding in, a, in and around the network without that sort of trace being there. And I mean, building this sort of easy tool to implement on top of these exchanges. I mean, we had a recent discussion where we talked about the current state of exchanges with uh, Gaber from uh, Van Eck. And, you know, I mean, this is just seems like any exchange that implements this Tresa service. I mean, it just seems like that is the old way of doing things that are trying to play ball to their the you know to the greatest extent they can while still consuming their customers value and you know per putting them into this system that isn't bitcoin and yeah i mean like maybe it's just these exchanges that do try to 
follow along and implement this sort of thing. It's like those are the, definitely the guys that are red flags you shouldn't be paying attention to. I mean, right now it is kind of hard to point at Coinbase and be like, this is everything they're doing wrong because, you know, it's a lot of little things that add up. And now it's like if you're just going to implement something like this on top of it, then, I mean, that's a pretty blatant yeah, bold move towards an opposite direction of what Bitcoin's roadmap is. So, yeah, I don't think this is going to get implemented too far. But I don't know. You know, it's the FATF. People take it seriously. Well, I mean, like, I think it's it's definitely more likely that this never materializes than it does. But, like, the, the main point I want to, to get across is, like, you know, for this to happen... The, all, all these governments in the world that don't get along have to get along. Yes, I, I get that's way more unlikely than likely, but it's the fact that they understand the difference between an attack that's viable and possible and one that isn't. You know what I mean? You don't see... Well, I mean, okay, ignore the, the fucking idiot in, in Congress talking about minors and human trafficking. You don't actually see like these kinds of groups and entities talking about just attacking the network through a mining attack or crazy un like infeasible things like that they look at what they can actually do and like a, a, a protocol like this that you legally force businesses to comply with that doesn't touch the consensus layer of the protocol but still can have very negative effects like they 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 get that that's the way you have to try and attack Bitcoin. So like even if this specific thing is unlikely and probably isn't going to happen, it's just the fact that like recognize the adversaries here actually understand the difference between something that might work as an attack and something that's a complete waste of time, and they're not wasting their time on shit that just will never work. Yeah, I mean, it definitely does. I mean, it's one of those attacks where, you know, it could cause a network fork. I mean, it kind of reminds me of 2X. So, I mean, as far as something that is worthy of paying attention to uh, as far as an attack on the network, I mean, but yeah. Like, that's kind of what I'm saying, though, Rick, is like this is, it, it, This can't. Like, this is this has nothing to do with, like, the consensus layer, but it could still have very negative effects on things. Yeah, I mean, the FATF is nothing to really scoff at. I mean, the, the stuff that they put forward at the beginning of 2018 as far as making it to where there is a regulatory practice between exchanges to KYC all customers and everything got pushed really far. And I mean, while I've talked about or just about how these exchanges have discussed the travel rule and, you know, but it is the FATF and, you know, we'll see who falls in line and who's. Who's not? But I mean, it is something where if enough people fall in line, it could, it's definitely still a problem. Also, I want to point out that um, Cypher Trace, uh, it's publicly known that they work for U.S. intelligence agencies. So, yeah, just a reminder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your friendly reminder. But I don't know, um, if, if there's nothing else anybody wants to add to this, um, you want to take us into the next one, Jimmy? Yeah, so uh, the next story is uh, about Keybase once again, which so far we haven't had a very positive opinion of it, but meow, pew pew, did you hear that? That's the sound of another unwanted stellar lumen airdrop in Keybase, otherwise known as the Normie encryption app. Um, I, along with a bunch of other people who use Keybase, sometimes got a message from an account called Space Drop today, and it said the following. Hello, handle, as in insert your handle here. Those are uh, free, they're free lumens worth $20.88 20 USD and a surprise gift from the Stellar Development Foundation because Keybase now supports the Stellar Network and therefore the cryptocurrency lumens. Everyone on Keybase is getting their share of 100 million lumens divided equally. You can do what you want with them, including passing them around to other Keybase users or moving them outside of Keybase. Details about me. 
the space drop account. I will run every month until I've run out of 2 billion lumens. So you'll get your share of 100 million lumens next month, blah, 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 blah. I'm a relentless bot, but I can't spam people. So after this gift, you'll have to register on the wallet tab of this app. If you don't see a way to register from the wallet ch tab, try restarting your Keybase app and make sure you have the latest version. And so I received this kind of message before. I believe there was another Lumens airdrop like several months ago, but I don't remember whether it came directly in the Keybase app or if it was an out of band notification. But um, many of you have been or will be tempted to accept this airdrop e and you know either sell it for Bitcoin or donate it to organizations like the Tor Project, which apparently accepts this shitcoin. But before doing that, uh, you should know that once you register the wallet tab in the Keybase app in order to accept the airdrop and any future airdrops, um, as far as we can see, there's no way to disable the wallet app, uh, the wallet tab in there. And um, according to some screencasts from not Groovals, uh, your Lumens wallet actually gets added to your Keybase profile as one of your identifiers. And at the, mo <laughs> at the moment, there's no way to remove it. Um, normally when you add an identity to your Keybase profile, <laughs> Shinobi, stop mimicking, that's a pizza oven. <laughs> Shut up. You can remove it, um, you can, so, eh, as I was saying, um, normally on your Keybase profile you can add and remove identifiers whenever you want to, but for some reason this wallet tab uh, doesn't, it doesn't allow you to remove the identifier. Um, of your Lumens wallet from your profile, which means we'll know all of the Bitcoin Keybase users who accept this airdrop because you'll make it really obvious. Uh, normally you can remove it by hovering over the little verified tag as you can see in the not groupables tweet, um, but uh, when you go to that, um, nothing appears uh, when you click on that Lumens identifier. So in my opinion, this is a very shitty thing to do. And also the fact that they announced the airdrop through a random account messaging, like messaging you called Space Drop, uh, that will no doubt train Keybase users to take shitty airdrop messages seriously and make it easier for scammers to socially engineer them. So thank you, Keybase developers, for making our job that much harder after two years of, or you know, two, three years of combating this shit. So yeah, I'm very not happy about this at all. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, this really really bothers me because like aside from like some bugs on the platform and this stellar shitcoin bullshit i really like keybase like i think it's a nice solid platform there there's a lot of stuff rolled into it like at all chats encrypted by default you have direct key access there's encrypted file systems that you can use private encrypted git repos like, if they cleaned up the bugs and stopped doing the shitcoin stuff, like, the, it would be my favorite chat platform out there. But, like, they keep doing this annoying shitcoin stuff, and they're not really prioritizing dealing with the bugs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm getting to where I like Keybase as well, but come on, man. Like, waking up to a space drop, another airdrop, like, man... What is this 2018 come on this was like this is just the desperation you see with some of these networks where it's like you see a coinbase announcement again about earning some of their network by uh learning some of their network and then you get some of these where it's just like hey you're part of this program where you know you have i think they gave us 20 bucks in stellar but i mean somebody made the great point where it was like they gave away this money million in stellar but that's all according to today's prices like you know, what's the price of Stellar going to be in a couple of years and how much is that to today? I mean, probably not near the amount that they're being able to market it as. Well, I mean, it's just, it's it's like, stop with the shit. Like, I mean, like, could you imagine how much more powerful and engaging, like, just integrating Bitcoin into this would be? Like, and not, and I don't mean like, here's free Bitcoin and like shoving it in people's faces. I mean, just like an option of something you can use if you choose to go turn it on. Like that would be so much better uh, of an experience and just productive of a, an action as a company versus like just here's this shit coin and, and continuing to shove it in people's faces. 
Yeah, but unfortunately, it's pretty obvious that this isn't about, you know, what's good for the users or interesting for the users. It's about the fact that here's where we got our money and now we're going to promote them and give all of our shit coins to all of our users who we're not actually catering to. So this is not a choice about, you know, ooh, making it easy to, you know, share coins with your friends or send coins to your friends or whatever. That's not what this is about because if they actually cared about doing that, they could have done it even easier by integrating a lightning wallet or something for these small amounts. Or, oh. I mean, like, like build a Xiaomi and eCash server or something. Like, just something Bitcoin-related that isn't, like, just shoving it in people's faces. It's just an option. I feel like that needs to be a meme that we make for you. Like every every solution to the problem, just make a Xiaomi new cash server. <laughs> oh, it already is. They're, we're playing back around the drinking game. I think it was. I can't remember the word that I was always saying early on, but yeah, early on it was like every time you heard eCash server, you had to drink. That was the game. Every time I say Chalm or Chalmi and take a hit. <laughs> But yeah, it looks like uh, Satwell posted this uh, screenshot in the chat whenever you get in there. It's just like that. The net, they say in a bullet point, the network itself has a decentralized exchange built into it, talking about Stellar. And it's just like, man, this is, I mean, it's straight just like belittling your customer's intelligence, just sort of saying like, yeah, this is what this is whenever these things are not really well defined or built out, but somehow it's been packaged into lumens and it works out and this is the way we're it just looks bad it's gonna look real bad you know going forward in the future when like you're saying janine i mean it's a lot easier to just implement some sort of lightning wallet to where people can actually move around these small amounts and you know they can say this sort of language without it being so uh fraudulent you know keybase is a huge phenomenon for me because it's uh i don't really like it it's an incoherent mess of softwares that tries to do so many different things and i have no idea what this thing is trying to accomplish and i was saying the exact same thing to slack like what is this you can talk with each other then what, what i i don't know it, it it was just a just an incoherent mess but maybe they are onto something just like slack was onto something on the beginning so I don't know. I mean, yeah, sure, Stellar. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> it, it looks like they really don't have a sense of direction. But uh, it's, it, it's a huge, yeah, it's a platform, you see. So wait, how do I participate in the Xiaomi and drinking game if I don't drink? Um, smoke weed. <laughs> <laughs> Take a shot of kombucha. You got. You, I mean, you, you can't play those games without alcohol or drugs. I mean, that's, that's how they work. That's, that's the point of the game. Yeah, you could take a hit of acid. <laughs> I I could try the kombucha, but I don't know where to find that. I'll have to look. It's so funny. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm just saying that you have to have some kind of addiction. Everyone has something you can find. No, but the addiction has to be something that inebriates you. That's the whole point of the game, to get fucked up. That's why you play the game. That's also okay, why then... the whole philosophy of fuck the games, I'm going to play drink this beer exists. Because it's all about just getting drunk. Oh, well, yeah, you know Janine's not playing that game. I would say just read a paragraph of that Bitcoin Billionaires every time you hear it. All right, I hate to say this, but let's talk about Tether again. Uh-oh, oh! here it comes. Yeah, Give so, it to us, man. So this is very interesting. Very interesting. So Tether has launched a um, Chinese yuan um, Tether, so a CNHT token. Um, and it's it's only going to be available on Ethereum as an ERC-20 token right now. But the reason this is so fucking interesting 
is two real main reasons. One, the, the use of USDT, the, the, the dollar version of the tether, is, is very high amongst Chinese citizens. Like that's that is a, a huge component of the tether user base, and the, the reason for that is because of the the insane controls China has clamped down, like effectively like banning all exchanges of, of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in the country, just the overall capital controls for their entire economy that they instantiate, and so like for them to roll out the Chinese yuan is very interesting because. If, if things play out logically here, I mean, what you're doing is giving people the choice now. Um, you know, as a Chinese citizen, do you want to have your stable coins risk and value um, exposed to the political risk of the U.S. government or the Chinese government? There's a choice now. So like what, what are our Chinese citizens going to do? Are they going to prefer the, the political and economic risk they're exposed to um, through America with USDT, or are they going to be, you know, preferring exposure to their own currency and their own government's risk? That will be a very telling thing. And then also, like, the other interesting thing about all of this is just the fact that you're now creating a dynamic between USDT and the, the, the tether yuan that like you can now have a pricing mechanism for the yuan that is it's it's free of manipulation you, you can't try to distort or or manipulate things trading through these tokens in the same way that you can conventional markets and businesses and, you know this is actually something that you, you've seen demonstrated by Bitcoin at a macro scale, like already, like there, there's, um, I forget the name of it, but there's literally a website hosted in Miami, Florida, that shows the street price of the Bolivar against the dollar, because it's illegal to advertise the street price of the Bolivar instead of the, the government mandated price in, in Venezuela. So they run this site out of Miami and how they get this street price is literally just looking at the, the price of Bitcoin on local Bitcoins and translating that through into dollars. So like it, it, it is definitively shown that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin existing when they're highly liquid show accurate prices of things like that, even when the government somewhere is trying to manipulate the exchange rate. And so now like that same kind of dynamic is pretty much being set up for the yuan right now. And so like, you know, both of these two things, when you look at it, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how this um, launch of, the, of this token by Tether plays out. Like, I think it will tell us a lot about just the general economic attitude towards this space in China and a little bit about, you know, their attitude towards their own currencies and where they want to expose themselves to risk in that regard. Cricket. Tether. Come on, Nopar, I thought you said you wanted to talk about <laughs> Okay, okay, I buy, I buy. Where can I buy some Tether? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 going to be interesting to see how it plays out. So I guess, uh, you know, if nobody else has anything to toss in on that, uh, Janine, I think uh, you're up next. Yeah, so I think Nopar will be able to provide more explanation if I don't say enough, but basically this is just a notice that um, as of two days ago, the wallet, uh, the Wasabi wallet website, wasabiwallet.io, is now available without JavaScript or cookies, and there's also a new Onion service that's reachable only through the Tor browser. And uh, it appears that Rick's awesome Bitcoin cypherpunk art for Block Digest has made it onto the static homepage where the uh, Wasabi sign is actually blinking. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I saw that, man. That looks really cool. I like the fact that they just, uh, you know, animated it a little bit and kind of threw it in the corner. I think it looks really good there. 
Yeah, thank, thanks a lot, Rick, for that. Uh, uh, but you, you were talking about this, didn't you? That uh, we want to base the website based on the your your creation. No. Yeah, we were having a back and forth there to see like uh, whether or not we should build something out that uh, differs from the artwork for the show. But I guess you know that one works fine as far as just making it look a little bit more animated. But, I mean, yeah, whenever I saw it, I was like, oh, man, you know, I should get back with you guys to see if, like, uh, there's some way I could clear that up to make it a little bit more favorable for you guys, however you want it. Because, yeah, it just seems like right now, geez, everybody's a little swamped doing everything, right? But, I mean, yeah, it looks good. I think the website looks great. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, just a little correction that the wording of that tweet was still... So it still doesn't have cookies, it still doesn't have scripts, it still doesn't uh, move you to, to query another Google site, Google site or Cloudflare or, or whatever. So, uh, and it still has the onion. Uh, that, that, that did not change. We, we never had, had these things in the first space to, to begin with. Uh, well, I, I can provide a little context to how, how this site came around because I quite liked the old one and I wrote every every line of code on on that. But uh, there was this guy, uh, Mynak, uh, he, he came to the Wasabi Slack and started very enthusiastically to, to contribute to the project, but he didn't contribute anything. Uh, he was he was creating uh, designs and stuff, and uh, he didn't contribute anything. But he created a lot of great designs, and then people become very enthusiastic. Hey, this is great! We should change the website for this. And well, so we had to h hire him. <laughs> that's that's a good way to find a job, right? You you go to an open source project, uh, act like you're contributing, or rather, trying to 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 make plans for them, and then the plans will become so so great that they won't won't be able to refuse to hire him to build the thing, and I become very satisfied with the result because he he I, I taught him he he cannot use any javascript and anything that he learned in doing web development and he did not use he he built the whole thing from scratch and and this was the result so so i think it, it was it was great yeah uh any more comments on this or should i move on no, I, I, just, I just want to say, like, I think, like, you know, sorry to burst uh, anyone's bubble, but, like, fuck the design and the aesthetics and shit. It's the fact that you just removed a major way to exploit or hack somebody who's trying to get your software in the process of them getting that software. And that is a huge thing in terms of just the overall like dealing with security in this space, trying to get software to users. And it's something that every project in this fucking space should be doing and learning from. Like if you are distributing software in this space where people are going to use it to manage their keys, you should have a way for a person to get that software, verify it's coming from you and not interact with JavaScript at any step of the way because that is a huge like route of exploitation on the internet well yeah that's what that's the bigger part that i thought we were going to talk about was like uh, i did notice my artwork on there but yeah just like in our last episode we talked about blocks vulnerabilities in the website and the way that that was you know just something that you're putting your customers at risk and the customers that come to these websites are yeah, it's important that these customers' information is taken seriously. And as a company, you know, that is just a very smart move to make sure that people that are coming to the site to grab the Wasabi wallet don't have to worry about these sort of uh, vulnerabilities popping up to where their information could be compromised. I also, did anyone notice at the very bottom, it says designed with love, not JS? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> 
Love for your privacy. Yeah, so so I I probably wasn't very clear with my correction, so I I do it again. We didn't have JS and cookies and these kind of things previously. We didn't have it. Uh, so the wording of David's tweet was, "We still don't have it," uh, which was an accomplishment by us to to be able to outsource a work for someone who is not in wasabi and make him to really not do these these things what are very very basics everyone is doing that uh what on, on the bigger picture what what you were talking it's it's not really the javascript and not really the cookies are the the problems here the the problems are that well you just put code into and put things into the user's computer and uh, okay they agree in terms and conditions and they can see that what you are putting into their computer but still it's just not realistic to review those things uh, at all so i mean i don't have a problem with javascript and cookies that much but uh, if you can you can do it without them then it's better to do it without them that's yeah. that's my position yeah that's my point you know david be better at english but um yeah you know it's point standing like whether you had javascript at, at some point in the past or not which you didn't like it, it's still a point like this should be standard for any site delivering software to users in this space like that is a route that people can be attacked through so it should be removed it doesn't matter that there's other ways they can be attacked you remove the ones you can you know what i mean like the yes. the not having a flashy website for a big game in security i think is a no-brainer yeah stay, stay lean Mm -hmm. uh, all right so next topic uh, private information retrieval and this is very fresh because it was just a live streamed uh, an hour ago or maybe two and i've only seen it once so i won't be able to explain to you what it was about but on the scaling bitcoin conference uh, there was a presentation that's called Private Information Retrieval in Bitcoin Light Wallets uh, by Henrik. Henrik Hadass. <laughs> Henrik Hadass. Oh my God. So, yes. And he presented a way how to do how, how do you establish your wallet balance uh, by using Bloom filters, but with, with the reverse Bloom filters, like like what, what, what the Neutrino, the Lightning guys are doing. Uh, it's like you are building index files on servers, on Bitcoin full nodes. Uh, they call it manifest files, so I will call it them too. And these manifest files are much more sophisticated and they have a much more category for these manifest files. So what we are doing in Wasabi is that we have one index file, one manifest file from addresses to every block. Uh, okay, what they are doing is that they have daily, weekly, monthly manifest files and they have uh, for addresses and and transactions and there is something else what they have manifest files. Anyway, they, they figured out, uh, as far as I understood, a much more sophisticated system with what then what we are doing in Wasabi or what the Lightning Network guys are doing. And I have no idea how they came to their numbers, but their numbers was really small. So it's like, man, it's really private way to to have a mobile wallet. Uh, basically, that's the bottom line here. Uh, I, I, I will have to, to look into it much more details. Maybe you guys want to look into it too, because this is, I think, something revolutionary. Oh, and the most the most uh, 
hilarious part of this presentation was that at the end he had a question about what do you think about the client side filtering stuff you know what uh, the lightning guys are doing or we are doing in wasabi and he didn't heard about it like man there is just two schools of knowledge like academia is living in such a bubble but they are coming to very very solid results uh anyway so yeah they, they they basically figured out the exact same thing what the lightning networks guys did in uh independent way and a much more rigorous sophisticated way so i think this research has great implications to the future i'm very excited to see about it maybe i won't be the one who, who builds this this time because we have good enough solutions but but please someone listening you are a programmer uh look into that and and, and build it because this will be the future yeah so what you're saying is some dude who had no clue that a bunch of people were working on client side filtering came up with a way more bandwidth efficient client side filtering proposal and proposed it. Exactly. Very interesting. <laughs> that has me wondering if maybe like people in this space uh, shouldn't try to compile some kind of index of stuff being worked on so that you don't have weird situations like this happening where two people were working on effectively the same thing for years at a time and had no idea that the other project existed you know what i mean yeah and you know they 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 are as i seen it they were so rigorous it might even go into Bitcoin core because uh, as 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 it stands right now, uh, as I was looking at the pull requests, uh, the client side filtering stuff is not going to go into Bitcoin core. Maybe they will uh, go to that route. That that would be that would be great. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like you know, if if this like I, I still need to watch the the presentations. Um... I was busy this morning. I that, I need to look at this one, and then I wanted to watch um the the coin join analysis one. But yeah, I mean, like if, if this pans out on a technical level, hell yeah! Like I, that's always been like one of like the things I look at neutrino, and it's like eh. like yeah, it's a huge privacy gain, but like it, it's a little resource intensive for like the seamless wallet you want working on your phone and if somebody's cracked it to the point where we can have an equivalent that is that efficient then like yeah that that is fucking awesome oh and and one more last comment to it that these very same guys uh in 2014 uh actually you know we had the bloom filtering light wallet uh, clients for a very long time and they improved upon the Bloom filtering light wallet clients. Uh, also, they were the very first ones who de-anonymized them. Blockstream, uh, Nick Jonas, Systasis came later. Uh, although they only de-anonymized them in theory and Nick Jonas de-anonymized them in practice too. But anyway, this this paper, what they had, uh, I was... I was amazed that no one ever cited them when 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 the conversation was about this because they they did a great job there. I I was actually reading that paper because Nicola Dorier was the one who tried to implement it. Maybe he succeeded too. And I was looking at the code based based on that paper. So, but that paper was kind of lost what they did, but they did a great job. Uh, on the other hand. I, I, I'm not sure how this works in academia, but when I was trying to download this new paper of them, uh, well, the, the, the website wants me to pay money, so uh, I, I really don't know how this works in academia. Like, like you have a research and make people who want to, that very, very few people who want to read that research, you have to pay money for it. I, I don't know. Let's see. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like, either way, though, like, that's, like, yeah, I need to really look into this and see how this works under the hood. 
All right, uh, I think we can move on to the next topic then. Alrighty. Well, uh, we're going back to Miniscript again, because uh, cause I'm just not accepting the, the nonsense arguments you made last time. And um, also, <laughs> Andrew, uh, I, th I think Andrew Palestra and Peter Wola were the authors of this, but um, <clears throat> Blockstream put out um, another kind of blog post about Miniscript um, since the, the original uh, announcement and the uh, Rust compiler for it were released. But it kind of just goes into, sh like, go through a little more concretely and I think better than I did the first time around, like, just how useful Miniscript is in a number of different areas. And, like, the, the first which is obviously going to be, like, optimizations. Um, so, for instance, <clears throat> when you're um, compiling a script that has multiple ways to spend it, well, I mean, there's different ways you can order that script. There's different ways you can compose that. And, you know, some might be more efficient in terms of the, the number of bytes they use than another one, it, especially when Taproot actually um, is deployed and goes live. And so, like, one, one of the functions of, you know, Miniscript is you can just type out a, a script um, component in Miniscript and literally assign like percentages to different paths so like you can write out a script and then tell the compiler like there is a 90 percent chance that the coins will be spent this way and only a 10 percent chance they'll be spent the other way and the compiler will take that into account when compiling it down to actual bitcoin script to to make it as efficient as possible and you know and kind of um uh tangent here um that ties into another example later is what using the mini script compiler they were actually able to take the script used by the liquid blockchain to lock the coins on the main chain and actually produced a five percent more efficient script using the mini script compiler than the script the blockstream engineers painstakingly optimized like by hand and so like like that, Th this way of, of handling script immediately made a 5% efficiency gain over what some of the smartest engineers in this space were able to do optimizing by hands. Um, like the other one, um, you know, I kind of mostly gone over is the fact that Miniscript allows like a wallet to be architected so that even if that wallet was not originally designed to know how to spend some strange weird script, it will still be able to figure out how to by reasoning and looking at the script in Miniscript. And so like if, if you have a wallet that just ha has absolutely no idea how to handle this weird multi-sig script that I set up, but I make one of those scripts with your key in it, if that wallet was built around using Miniscript in the core of the architecture, your wallet could just take the script, figure it out, and it would work fine. It would be able to analyze that script and spend it. That's a huge thing. Like another thing is, um, you know, we, we covered months ago Blockstream's proof of reserves tool. Um, to allow businesses to actually provably audit Bitcoins that they hold. While Miniscript lets something like that become much more easily standardized so that something like that is easier to take off in the space. Like another uh, obvious example I've kind of gone over is like you can take a multi-sig two of three policy say and instead of one of those keys just being a key you can rip that out and replace that with anything you want it could be two keys or two keys in a hash lock or two keys and they have to wait and you can just pull one of those keys out of that two of three setup and replace it with this crazy arbitrary thing and your software will work with it other people's software will work with it and like the, the most <clears throat> like interesting example I think is Miniscript and being able to analyze and compose scripts like this is actually being used as the basis to develop a, a new way of doing a federated sidechain called a dynamic federation. 
where the existing federation for that side chain can just dynamically <clears throat> like remove or add new members to it based on the the you know being able to meet the thresholds to move those coins on the main chain and so like that's a very complicated thing that's dangerous where you need to be very sure that the scripts you are looking at moving the coins into are correct that they're not going to result in money being lost or removed from people's control and something like miniscript makes that much safer to actually architect and engineer and so like you know you look at all these things and, and i hope that you know maybe you have a better idea of why i'm so psyched about this than the first time we covered it and like just to show that like this has already had a real world impact by taking the scripts that the liquid side chain uses and making them five times more efficient than the smartest people in the space were able to do by hand you know and i hope now you can see like this is going to be a very powerful thing for developers in this space so i i would move a little bit this conversation in what's the what's the bitcoin core developer roadmap with mini script <laughs> uh, let 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 me elaborate on that so yeah uh, bitcoin started uh, in a way that satoshi put a bunch of scripts into bitcoin and then people found uh, more and more vulnerabilities uh, with those scripts and uh, so at one point uh, <clears throat> we just took out a a bunch of those scripts and started to introduce them one by one later on now anyhow uh the problem with this of course it's the huge problem of ethereum that you can't really verify the things that uh why well, is this language really safe and not going to just blow up bitcoin uh if it's used in a specific way uh there is no mathematical guarantee for for that script and and then when miniscript came around i think that's what i've i've read that this this script is verifiable what does it verify i don't know but 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 verifies stuff so verifies that bitcoin is not going to to be definitely not going to be blown up by 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 miniscript uh, right so miniscript compares to bitcoin script so is well, the no, idea I, I have to stop you real quick here like i think you're confusing miniscript and simplicity like miniscript yes, just takes I, the I did. like miniscript is just like the existing bitcoin scripts right now and it's not even all of them like some of the the scripts that actually exist on bitcoin are not part of mini script because they only included the the existing ones that you can safely like analyze and prove and optimize like this with mini script so that's just the existing bitcoin script simplicity though is the language where they're trying to do like something that's more like a provably safe ethereum Yes, uh, I, I I mixed up the two things. My bad. Oh, good. Yeah, this this though is like this makes just this the output descriptors that Peter Woolley designed. Like that's what like lets you now search the UTXO set. Um, for a specific script instead of having to rescan the whole blockchain um, to check your wallet balance and the partially signed Bitcoin transaction standard like these three things together are going to take the compatibility between different pieces of software in this space right now from like being a giant fucking pain in the ass to like everything that uses those three things together will be able to seamlessly interact with every other thing that uses those three things together. Okay, Shinobi rant done. Johnny rant starting now.
Uh, well, it's not much of a rant because we've had several stories like this one over the years. But once again, someone who was publicly known to have a lot of Bitcoin recently narrowly avoided an armed robbery against his private residence in Oslo, Norway. <laughs> And a local broadcaster there reported that um, the indictment filed by the Oslo Attorney General's office alleged that the attempted robbery occurred back in May. And though the attacker was armed, no shots were fired because after the victim opened the door and faced the attacker, he then managed to jump off his own balcony to escape. Um, I don't think it mentioned whether any Bitcoin was actually stolen or whether jumping off the balcony resulted in injury or anything like that. Um, but I guess we'll find out because uh, the first hearing is scheduled for mid-October. So this is just another reminder that it, even if you're not a wealthy individual or you don't consider yourself a wealthy individual, you could easily become one at any point and you really need to protect your physical security. And I'm not even talking about installing security security systems at your home, like cameras or alarms or anything, or arming yourself if you're in the country where you can do that. But I mean, basic shit, like be careful when you talk about Bitcoin, be careful where you talk about Bitcoin and where you wear uh, Bitcoin memorabilia. And for goodness sake, uh, you should install a peephole in your door so that you can check whether the person who just rang your doorbell is going to hold a gun to your head, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, even just like, thinking through like if something like that happens like how would you escape i mean you know like i could be wrong here but i find it hard to believe that a person would just blindly jump off of a balcony like that without that having been something they had considered or ran through their head before so like even if it's just something you you only give like a little thought to once like just think about that like, if somebody did come into your home like that with the intent to hurt you or rob you, like, how would you escape from there? What is the fastest way to get out? Also, you should consider that because, you know, this mostly comes up with people who are wealthy, but I would argue that people who have, like, median amounts of Bitcoin are actually at more risk a lot of the time because... When you have a smaller amount of Bitcoin that's not, you know, it's not going to make headlines or the, you know, it's not enough that the police would take a lot of interest in that, you know, it, it still provides an incentive for someone to launch an attack against you, which may only cost them, you know, I mean, in this case, this guy literally just basically walked up to this guy's apartment and he had a gun. It didn't cost him anything really to do the attack besides purchasing, I assume, some kind of disguise. So you're still dealing with an attacker who does not have to spend a lot of money to physically attack you um, or intimidate you, um, but the reward is still greater than that. So if you're dealing with a country where you're not likely to get help from police or law enforcement in order to either protect you or get your money back if it does get stolen, you might actually be in a worse position than someone who is, has a lot more Bitcoin and is wealthier. So don't think that this is only something that you need to consider once you have a lot of wealth. This is something you have to consider even for, you know, median savings amounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd say this, this is one of those things where, you know, I look at it, it's like, it's really, uh, it's, it's hard because it's one of these things where it's like you got somebody like myself who's trying to grow Bitcoin in the meat space and like, you know, having these meetups and it's very public about, everything I'm doing and trying to uh, just build out the network here. But it is really unique to the situation where I feel comfortable doing that because of the fact that I'm in this, you know, weird setting where there is a lot of value just lying around to where somebody, you know, it's everybody's unique to this situation. And it is one of those where it's like, I've got military training and I've spent, I've spent time in combat. And I mean, I'm not too afraid of situations that could get hairy and I don't know, I've adapted and moved really quickly through things. Like I understand like having a plan, but I also understand like if something comes up and it, your plan isn't the way to move, you know, just move quickly and adapt to the situation. But yeah, I mean, I work with people like this and you know, where it's that risk is always there. It's really hard to say like how you grow the meat space without 
you know, having people that are public about this stuff and sort of just hoping that uh, the people that are doing this are, you know, good in their operational security and the way that they, you know, you know, someone like myself who's just really highly aware of things. And, you know, I'm always a little dubious of maybe some new character coming into my life or something like that. And I don't know, that's just a risk that comes with the space, especially if you want to try and grow the space like on a network level on the ground. It's like at a certain point, you know, guys like myself have to step out and uh, not have to, but, you know, there are people that need to do that in order to grow that network. So it's a predicament. Yeah, I would also like to point out the paradoxes in this story is that a robbery in Norway in a Scandinavian country is just so <laughs> unreal. No, no, an armed robbery. Those guys should only have axes and shields and beards. Like, it's it's just, I don't know, it's, it's so crazy. Yeah, there's paradoxes in this for sure. It's like, we need to grow the space, but we also need to be very conscious of the fact that there are people out there who don't understand this technology and are willing to do something stupid to try and get their hands on it. But yeah, it's a, I think it's a situation where everybody kind of has to take in to account what they're trying to achieve and, you know, how it's best to achieve that. Wait, so I think we should clarify, is a beard a defense? No. Is that like a defensive tool? <laughs> <laughs> it kind of is. It is yeah. unless, unless you are Superman and each hair in your beard is as strong as a piece of titanium, no. no but, well, but Superman doesn't have a beard. He's always clean shaven. Because well, what he if, just like, laser you know, it off. What if the attacker's like, I was going to go after this person, but their beard is just so perfect. I've got to ask him out on a date or something instead. <laughs> Yeah, so that just got me thinking. <laughs> that just that just got me thinking. Like, if you were to like cut Superman's hair, does his hair act, can it actually get cut? Like, how well, does that work? Does he cut. just go bald every time you, he's in a fire because his hair burns off? You cannot cut his hair. Like, you, Superman cannot even have a blood sample taken because a needle can't get through his skin. Like, he but is he the could... only one who can do shit about that. Wow, so does that mean that Superman is, like, stuck with the same haircut for his entire life? Where is that? God, oh, that would it's, suck. It's, it's, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, gonna try, I'm gonna try and, and wrap up the trip into the weeds right here. Each era, of, like, the Golden Age, the Silver Age, like, they've always changed, like, how Superman's powers work. Like, in the Golden Age, when he started, he was literally fucking invincible. He could get a nuclear bomb dropped on him and, and recently they've kind of toned it down a little bit yeah have, have 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 they toned it down enough that he can get a haircut i don't know with normal scissors <laughs> no yeah at least goku can change it a true Man, born saint's saint. hair never changes from the day he was born with the exception of beards and mustache Okay, <laughs> let's move on. All right, folks, we are moving on back into the topic of mining regulation and how that affects the industry. Last episode, we discussed the mining industry in Iran being chased away by heavy-handed regulations, which was a result of miners flooding into the area and consuming large amounts of energy. And so uh, then we talked about how a portion of that industry moved to Siberia, where they are working with local governments and electricity companies to maintain a favorable environment for the miners over there. Well, today we have this article by Bitcoin Magazine, where they cover how the mining industry in Quebec has been feeling the pressure from a recent change in the political landscape. Back in 2017, we had our first special edition with Jonathan Bertrand, where we discussed the topic of the initial pullback from Hydro-Quebec electricity contracts being issued to the mining industry. They uh, currently support 668 megawatts of hydropower over there, and that's dedicated to these quote-unquote blockchain companies with another 300 megawatts available for new contracts. This article in the show notes covers a company called BitFarms who has gotten really cozy with the government and regulations to grow their operations there in Quebec. BitFarm's CEO Jonathan Ham Hamill said 
Quote, the energy market in Quebec is highly regulated. It can definitely be a complicated and lengthy process to outsiders, but our team has been doing business in Quebec for more than a decade in the data center sector and now in the blockchain sector. Close quote. Well, then this is this, and they're building out uh, their fifth mining facility in the area. So while they're building out their fifth facility, not all mining companies are happy to yield to these to this regulatory environment. Late last year, there was a parliamentary election which brought in a sentiment that the industry isn't really welcome to the area, which, to be honest, I'm seeing some conflicting arguments about this, and uh, this change should have brought in more favorable regulations for the industry, but apparently it hasn't. So Blockstream recently announced their mining facility in the area, but also some in the state of Georgia. Samson Mao told Bitcoin Magazine, quote, it's the political uncertainty. If they have looked at how they've, repre- how they've presented themselves to the public, the government of Quebec would realize they haven't exactly delivered a very cohesive message to companies interested in investing, close quote. So they decided to expand their operations to Adele, Georgia, which, where they are getting electricity rates between 5 to 6 cents per kilowatt hour. Those prices in a historically conservative area of the country make it more suitable for Bitcoin mining companies than places like Quebec. Now, it could be that once more mining companies come to Georgia, we see a similar situation play out there where the local government starts regulating these electricity contracts a little bit more heavily. However, the conservative governments in the U.S. are usually more are going to favor companies that are bringing jobs and profits to the area. So, yeah, we'll have to see how this plays out over time. So we're seeing these mining dynamics with the electricity contracts and regulations being the catalyst for operations setting up shop in certain geographical areas. And this was always the game. We'll always see miners running to completely unregulated markets to capitalize on that cheap electricity and uh, bring it to areas that does not have this cheap electricity. So, yeah, if there are some viewers from the Quebec area that could maybe comment in the in the comments below as far as to what they think is going on with the government there and how that could favor the industry or not favor the industry, that would be great to hear your sentiment because I was getting these conflicting articles on the sentiment there. But yeah, so that seems to be the story. And uh, yeah, we're just going to continue to see this mining ecosystem evolve with the regulation as it comes in so uh yeah did you guys have any comment about what's going on there in quebec and you know hydro quebec and the way that their electricity contracts have uh and the mining industry over there in general has kind of declined since that initial 2017 rush i mean i'm just like happy to see bit farms expanding like you know a local business in the region that's actually trying to host shit for you know users and people around there because i remember when that moratorium went up and like that whole situation was going on like they were really like in a bad spot like they they were at the point where like any expansion they would have made past their existing facilities would have just jacked up their electricity prices and you know now that everything is done and settled and we've seen that kind of political turnover and attitude change. I, I'm glad to see like them <clears throat> getting back to expanding instead of the entire area just becoming dominated by like foreign or outside, you know, companies or influences. Yeah, I mean, I guess that was like they've been in the in the industry with those data centers for a long time before the mining industry really came to the area. So whenever that initial uh, kind of just pushback on all the contracts coming into the area, I imagine that they did see a large increase because, yeah, they've been doing business there for a long time. And so I guess it is at least, yeah, it's a great thing to see that, you know, a company like Bitfarms is still getting, they're moving forward in that environment still. And, you know, as long as there's, you know, more hash rate here and there all over the place, that's a better thing. That's a good thing for Bitcoin. So, I mean, while it is maybe not favorable for all companies and all miners, it is something where, I mean, the hash rate, yeah, it's still going up. And no, not a death spiral. Still going up and still getting more and more decentralized. Tangent, Janine, he shaves with a kryptonite razor. That's how he does it. Are you serious? I don't know. 
It's the only that thing would that be makes funny. sense. All right. Well, I guess that that regulation is the kryptonite over there to the mining industry. Getting back on track here, but yeah. So that's what's going on over there. But I guess uh, there's something else going over on over there in Canada or in Vancouver with patients info and not being encrypted. What's that all about? Yeah, so this isn't a Bitcoin story, but I think it's important enough to mention it's an encryption story. Let's go with that, um, or the la la lack thereof. Um, so the Open Privacy Research Society published a press release two days ago disclosing that they had accidentally, like they literally just found it by accident, discover uh, that they had discovered unencrypted medical information being broadcast across the Vancouver area via the hospital paging systems. Uh, they write in the press release, the data being broadcast includes the patient's name, age, gender marker, diagnosis, their attending doctor, and room number. Other broadcasts re uh, regarding medical tests such as x-rays are often associated with a patient's last name or medical number, exposing their progression through hospital departments. Some broadcasts appear to contain free-form text, allowing other sensitive information to be entered as well. We have been able to confirm the authenticity of this data by cross-referencing records with public obituaries. Open Privacy immediately began responsible disclosure of this issue with the Vancouver Coastal Health uh, VCH in December, no, November 2018. After several attempts at contact, we were informed in a brief email in December 2018 that the issue had been escalated. After several months of no follow-up and with the breach still ongoing, Open Privacy made the decision to contact journalists and begin public disclosure of the existence of this breach in an attempt to inform the public while minimizing the potential harm. We provide a full disclosure timeline along with the press release. And then furthermore, they say that it was only after they disclosed the details of this breach to a journalist um, who subsequently contacted the VCH that they received responses and further questions about this breach from VCH. And in addition, we also contacted the Office of the Information Privacy Commissioner in British Columbia and have cooperated in their investigation into this breach. Uh, the VCH informed us that they have undertaken an under... Yeah, they have undertaken an investigation after our initial report, but the system under, investi under investigation was deemed secure as it was sent to specific pager devices and didn't seem to rely on any radio connection and that their investigation findings lead us to believe that patient information is protected um, and not being intercepted. Well, clearly not the case. Uh, and then two weeks ago, uh, after Open Privacy clarified multiple misconceptions around pager operations and provided heavily redacted samples to VCH, we received confirmation of this breach from the general counsel slash chief, chief privacy officer at Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, however, that confirmation came with denial of the seriousness of the breach of patient privacy and security. Uh, so if you want to hear more about this, especially if you're a Canadian in the Vancouver area, you can find more information about this at the Open Privacy website, openprivacy.ca. Hopefully the hospitals involved will be more cooperative and forthcoming going forward so that people can find out whether their sensitive medical information was exposed and try to fix some of that damage. Uh, you know what would be the best way to solve this? A medical blockchain where all of your private health information is broadcast and verified by everyone. <laughs> oh, yeah! wait. Look, you can do all of the badness of a medical blockchain and you don't even need a blockchain. So, yay, there goes that use case. Medical records on the blockchain. Woohoo! Like, just. No, be, mean, be an even bigger uh, nerd and broadcast it over radio signals. <laughs> like, this is just like, you know, this topic of just the complete lack of security on computing devices in general just, like, keeps coming up. And I mean, like, I really think at this point that, like, it's going to take a Bitcoiner out there or some Bitcoiners out there when it's worth a hundred thousand dollars a million dollars a coin just going fuck it like let's dump money into this until we have secure shit and then just start selling that
Well, I guess so, man. I mean, there's the really hard to figure out what is it that's going to make people decide to take people's personal information seriously and actually block it up appropriately. I mean, it seems to be the best thing is just more and more of these very public vulnerabilities being exposed and the companies taking the backlash from that, you know, like, uh, you know, we all remember still the Equifax hack and the Facebook camera Analytica and these sort of stories caused a big um, drop in those stock prices. But, you know, it's a, uh, it's hard to say if that actually makes them take this stuff seriously because, uh, I don't know, I'd have to go back and look and see how exactly those operations really changed because I know they put out a bunch of press releases about changes, but, you know, see how the implementation actually goes into effect. Come on, Bitcoiners. If you are not all out there thinking about how to build the next apples by building actually secure computers from the ground up or a fucking i don't know anything like that then we're all retarded and this isn't gonna work like a blockchain phone or something <laughs> say that just again around. i'll fucking slap I'll you joke. i will fucking slap you oh goodness that was a funny one yeah Hey, I thought I thought that the Bitcoin mumble was supposed to be free from threats of violence. Nope. Oh, Just that's the one thing. Violence. No way. Yeah, definitely not three, free from threats of violence. I believe the notice on the website says something about how we're open to all perspectives, Shinobi. <laughs> yes, including drunk people named Jao who threatened to fight you. Oh, yeah. All right. All, all right, right, so... Okay. Yeah, let's get into this next one. It might this this might be the solution here. Alrighty. So um there is a new piece of malware floating around out in the world. And I'm not really gonna concentrate on the malware itself, how it, it goes about infecting um you know a device. It really it, it's just it's a, a very adaptable smart piece of malware that goes around infecting devices for a botnet that's the particulars of how it it works isn't really important what's important is how they are coordinating the botnet so any kind of of botnet you know malware to, to coordinate that botnet you need a command and control server you need a central place that each device that piece of malware infects with knows to phone home to that you can give it instructions with and that's always created you know a problem because you know it's like what do you do you have to code that into the malware like how do you update that how does that updating process for a command and control server work if you have 100,000 infected machines out there and your server is taken down or compromised or that domain or IP address is seized, how do you get an update for a new server to every one of those 100,000 compromised devices? Well, um, this new variant of the Gleptiba malware is using Bitcoin. And they've actually built into the malware a, a parser that will connect to Electrum servers and scan relevant addresses and transactions and look for instructions to update the command and control server encoded in op return outputs in a Bitcoin transaction. So like this, this is this piece of malware is actually using the Bitcoin network in an intelligent way to solve a major problem that has always existed for this type of a malicious activity like you know that that botnet every single bot has to talk to some central thing to get updates and if you take that fucking central server down then you you've not gotten rid of the botnet but you've gotten rid of the ability for it to be updated redirected at things so on and Bitcoin is the perfect fucking coordination point to handle that in a way where 
every single bot can seamlessly just track and move to new command and control servers as old ones are brought offline and new ones are brought online. Someone's finally realized you can do this. And it's going to be very interesting going forward because there's really no way to stop this except remove op return. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, this is a thing now. And I think it's going to become a very big thing and a very unstoppable thing. This is an interesting showcase of, of what blockchain works uh, for and what blockchain doesn't work for, right? What do you yep. get with blockchain? Censorship resistance. And now you need censorship resistance <laughs> and you got it. <laughs> but putting medical data on the blockchain doesn't really require censorship resistance. But keeping a botnet pointed at the right command and control server does. <laughs> Yeah, let's uh, think about the ethical implications of that, right? Well, I mean, that's like, that's really, this is going to be a huge game changer, I think, for the entire InfoSec space, because that's like, that's been the way really, you know, to deal with, well, not completely deal with, but like mitigate the threat of a botnet once it's discovered and identified and isolated before you get to the point of like actually you know identifying each infected machine purging and cleaning that like it it's always been like get the command and control server offline or unreachable first and then deal with like the individual machine infections and when when, when these botnets start all shifting over to using this kind of mechanism to coordinate with a command and control server that's absolutely not a viable strategy anymore like that doesn't work because they'll just update it and every single bot will be able to see that update and move to it so like security researchers are going to have to completely rethink how they deal with botnets like this speaking of game changers if no one has any other topic then i go on to the last one yeah any other comment all right so the mastering lightning network book the work on the mastering lightning network book has finally started and i have to say i i have never thought fixing typos is so much fun <laughs> because because you 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 have to realize that contributing to to this book is is revolutionary every little issue that you solve there is going to prevent uh, future generations of developers to make mistakes uh, and I invite everyone to come and fix typos and maybe contribute a little bit more uh, with me to the Mastering Lightning Network book. Uh, it's, it's, it's really fun. I actually uh, might do that because, you know, I, I'm looking forward to this book. Like, I, I have a pretty good understanding of the Lightning Network, I think, but there are definitely big holes where my understanding does not go down to the low level. And like, I, I'm just looking forward to this book because it's going to be so much easier just going through this than like digging around all of the mailing lists and, and Git repos and, and discussions and shit. Exactly. That would be my second point that uh, by contributing to this, I or you may even begin to understand the lightning network uh, much better uh, and so 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 it's 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 really really good and it's much more fun you know understanding something when a lot of other people are enthusiastic about that and you are communicating with them then five years from now you read this book because well let's be honest if you want to stay in bitcoin then there is a very high chance that you are going to to get this book into your hands uh, so maybe maybe just start now while while it's it's being built 
Mm-hmm. And the very last point, what what I just so in the very first chapter of the Mastering Lightning Network book, uh, they pointed out that the very first unidirectional payment channel was proposed uh, by a Bitcoin Talk user called Hashcoin. Uh, I would like to to test if you what? remember this name, no. Hashcoin. That's factually, I've, I've never heard of that, but that's factually incorrect. The first payment channel proposal was from Satoshi and literally built into the Bitcoin protocol. That was the whole point of the end sequence field was to have like a sequence number where only the the most recent transaction was enforced it was just impossible to work because you couldn't enforce that with consensus yeah that, somebody that has a pull request to do <laughs> no i i mean that was talked about too and uh, i have to say uh by fixing typos i did not quite understand the end sequence part of the book but yes uh, that that was where the history started and uh, what they said is the very first unidirectional payment channel proposal was by hashcoin in 2011 i don't know if it's correct i'm gonna go argue with lightning developers i think yeah go go ahead it's it's still in very immature document yet but what I wanted to point out with this is that Hashcoin was actually the very first guy, the very first source I was able to find about someone proposing CoinJoin. So, and this, whoever this guy was, really knew his stuff in 2011. And, you know, actually, now that I think about it, I think this is going to be interesting because, like, I, I remember, like, two or three years ago, Somebody linked me to a Bitcoin talk post by Greg Maxwell describing something like the Lightning Network being built out of basic payment channels before anybody had to like consider something like that. I'm going to be like, and I have, okay, I'm not going to say I haven't been able to find it. I've been way too lazy to literally page by page go through all of Greg's post because fuck that, that motherfucker posts way goddamn too much. But it'll be interesting if that gets pulled up into that discussion. Uh, I went through Greg's post many, many times and uh, he's just, every time he speaks, it's, it's there is something inside that's some unexplored idea uh, it's it it will be very fun to go through. I think mm-hmm. so. Go ahead. I mean, dude, like that motherfucker. Like, I don't think people really understand unless they've been here that long. Like, if you take an idea in Bitcoin, there's a ninety percent chance that you're probably going to trace that to Greg Maxwell whispering in someone's ear at some point. <laughs> so, final thoughts. I don't know who's got one. All right. Yeah, final thought. We talked about it for a second. Uh, The Scaling Bitcoin Conference is going on right now. It's the 11th and 12th. So uh, try and catch what you can online there. And I'm sure you'll see some good content coming out of there afterwards. And the Baltic Honey Badger Conference is coming up on the 14th and 15th. So we should see some cool stuff out of there too and also just uh meetups don't forget your meetups people go support your local meetups or if your meetup is in a bad way start a new meetup just meetups uh so i have two final thoughts they're pretty quick one uh considering what day it is you should check out uh the rolling stone article titled we're only beginning to see the consequences of the bush era assault on civil liberties great article about the uh terrorist screening database being finally declared unconstitutional i think i mentioned that last week 
Um, also, I have uh, published the slides from my talk at the BTC 2019 conference from two weeks ago, so those are now available. Uh, it was titled Bitcoin Privacy, so if you want to kind of see a Bitcoin Basics type uh, introduction to privacy tools and strategies, that's what I covered, and that is all. No problem. Wasabi 0 0.17 has been just released a few minutes ago and this is a disaster because Lucas proposed to remove the Chinese password box and uh, others agreed so no! no Chinese password box anymore why right ladies fuck. and gentlemen we have an end of episode oh, shinobi fuck. rant <laughs> fuck fuck that I'm forking Wasabi fuck you guys I'm forking Wasabi. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I don't know, I guess, uh, I don't know, my final thought is if you haven't watched it yet, go watch our interview with uh, Gabor Gerbax from Vanek and watch the, the Shy 256 I, I'm making, you, you fuckers. Watch them. Adios. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Watch my videos. He was there, was there. That's how it's just